On behalf of BioIT World's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Perficient, I'd like to welcome you to Pharmacovigilance Innovation, AI and Automation for Case Processing. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and technical director for today's event. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. He is Eugene Stefanov, who is Marketing Manager at Perficient. Welcome, Eugene. The presenter ball is yours. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Eugene Stefanov, as Elizabeth mentioned. I'm part of the marketing team at Perficient, and I'm super excited that you've joined us for today's webinar, in which we'll discuss AI and automation for case processing. Before we move on to a brief overview of Perficient, I'd like to cover some basic housekeeping items. You are welcome to submit questions to our speakers at any time today. They will be addressed as time allows towards the end of the presentation. If you still have unanswered questions after the webinar, feel free to contact our speakers directly. Their information will be available in this presentation. You can also fill out the contact us form found on Perficient's website. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be sent to you within a few days. Uh, just to mention a little bit about the chat, it's on the right-hand side of your screen, and you can just fill it, uh, type in your questions throughout the presentation. All right, a little bit about Perficient. So Perficient is a leading global digital consultancy. We imagine, create, engineer, and run digital transformation solutions that help our clients exceed customer expectations, outpace competition, and grow their business. With strategy, creative, and technology capabilities, we really bring big thinking and innovative ideas, along with a practical approach to help the world's largest enterprises and biggest brands succeed. We have a broad network of locations across the US, as well as near shore and offshore facilities in India, China, Colombia, Mexico, and Serbia. Founded in 1997, we're a public company with more than 4,500 employees. We've formed strategic partnerships with many of the major technology vendors and we have dedicated solution and industry practices as well. One of these industry practices is, of course, life sciences. We have relationships with many pharma, biotech, medical device, and CROs, including over 30 of the world's largest public life sciences companies. So this slide here talks about our pharmacovigilance capabilities. I'm not going to go into detail here, but we do have a dedicated safety and PV practice at Proficient that's run by Carrie, who is one of today's speakers. Uh, many of the folks uh, on her team actually come from industry. And you can take a closer look at the slide when you receive the presentation. So today we have three awesome speakers. All of them happen to be my colleagues. I'll ask each of them to give a short introduction, starting with Carrie. Hi, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending um, a little bit of time with us. And if you're in the Gulf states, our thoughts are with you because you're probably standing in some water. But um, I'm Carrie Blejo Owens, I'm the Director of Safety and Pharmacovigilance at Proficient. My background is really more on the other side of the table, if you will. Um, I came from pharma on the PV operations and regulatory side, and also have um, a number of years working in a CRO. So I'm happy to be here, and um, thanks again. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Prabha, can you say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Eugene. And thanks, everyone, for joining this call. Um, I'm Prabha Ranganathan. I'm also part of Life Sciences Business Unit here at Proficient. I am responsible for clinical data warehousing and analytics, and we work with a um, lot of pharma companies and CROs delivering solutions in this space. Uh, we also uh, deliver custom solutions and integrations, and uh, uh, part of the solutions that our team delivered is uh, what you're going to see today. And um, I also have about 
15 years experience delivering products primarily for uh, pharma uh, companies. Great, thank you, Prabha. And Christine. Hi everyone, Christine Livingston. I run our artificial intelligence practice at Proficient. I've been in the space for about five and a half years looking at ways that we can help embrace and adapt artificial intelligence technologies and work very closely with Kerry and Prabha in the life sciences space to make some of those technology visions come to life. Great, thank you. So at, at this point, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Carrie for the main portion of this presentation. I'll come back uh, during the Q&A portion and speak to you then. Carrie, the ball is yours. Thanks, Eugene. Um, and you can still see the um, PowerPoint, correct? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so this morning, um, what we'll do is we'll briefly go through some of the challenges um, in the world of pharmacovigilance. Things are certainly different than they were five years ago. Um, and if we take a look back at 10 years ago, when we were still probably, some of us, um, shuffling papers or documents, um, we're finding that our world is changing and that we really need good processes within our PV operations group to support this, but also technology is playing a greater role. Um, we'll look at the case processing workflow and highlight where some of the solutions around AI um, that Christine mentioned and Prava um, can be um, enhanced so that you can save time and effort. And we'll also look at um, what natural language processing um, and the end-to-end -end data flow and the technology that can support the things that we'll demonstrate this morning um, looks like. We'll do a, a quick demo, and this is a POC, and I just want to be um, very clear that um, when you're looking to implement any kind of technology solution, um, whether it's automation or AI or any anything to enhance the workflow, um, what we normally do is take a step back and look at the individual components of your workflow and look at uh, developing a common sense roadmap and then build upon that roadmap. So this morning what we'll focus on is just the intake of adverse events and PQCs. Depending on what your process is, this may be um, a pain point where you feel a little overwhelmed because things stack up, or it may be working. Um, it may be working really well. Um, most of the clients that we're um, currently engaged with do have issues, especially now that user vigilance is sending in cases um, to marketing authorization holders. There's now a demand for more information coming in from social media. Uh, from the literature um, and call centers and all of these um, intake points, if you will, um, sometimes become very disorganized. And so what we'll show you this morning is a way to make that disorganization actually go away and to be able to demonstrate how this one section in the PV, overall PV workflow, um, can, um, can be enhanced. And then we'll take a look at um, what the results are of um, this type of automation um, and AI layering will, um, will give to your PV system. And then more importantly, when you're going and you're trying to implement um, these types of solutions, it always um, is a time and money endeavor. So. It's going and making your business case. And one of the things that we found is that looking at the return on the investment and discussing that openly with executive management or whoever is holding um, the purse strings can actually support and help you plan out um, the roadmap that you'd like to take to, um, to automate, to add artificial intelligence to um, your platform. So, we do have larger case volumes. Um, we do have huge um, sources of information, misinformation, incomplete information. Um, we do have the challenge of now incorporating real world, real world data and real world evidence. Um, 
as products move farther into different geographic areas, we have new indications, new geographies, which can present their own set of problems, such as language barriers and also um, technology challenges. And then um, something now that we're dealing with is um, payer provider considerations and being able to really get our data in real time. And what does that really mean? Um, it used to be that we would do our aggregate reporting and we would take a snapshot of what our data and what our risk benefit profile looked like um, in the past. Now in today's world where things are has shown us the value of being able to pivot and to, to analyze aggregate data very quickly, um, we'd like to move, and there is quite a bit of pressure on industry to move from that reactive state where we're running our line listings or we're looking at risk-benefit profiles um, from maybe one, two, or even the last quarter and making decisions based on that data that's now what what we would consider old or reactive into a more proactive state. And proactive pharmacovigilance um, is, is a state where we can, we have our hands on the data every day. We can, um, we have technologies that can support good digested aggregate analysis um, that's easy to run. And we have a workflow where we have less touching and less human engagement not that we're going to give up everything, but we're simply pivoting to be able to be better stewards of the products that are on the market. So if you look at a typical adverse event case processing workflow, and, and everybody does theirs differently, but typically you have um, one or more intake methods um, and then things that go into the PV bucket, which are adverse events. Um, clinical trials, clinical, clinical trial cases will go into data entry, they'll go through case processing. Um, there's some form of QC um, at one or multiple points. Uh, the medical review and then submission to a regulatory authority or to um, a safety data exchange agreement partner. Not to mention that we have a slew of aggregate reports um, such as the PEGR or the DSUR that we have to um, be ready to submit as well. And if you look at this slide, what we've done is we've kind of cut the pieces out of your holistic system, meaning end-to-end -end, um, PV. And we've highlighted in pink the areas where um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, automation, all of these things can be layered independent of what adverse event database that you're using. So these are all database agnostic um, approaches so that you can um, process a case faster, more accurately, with less resources, which allows you um, a bit of return on time, which we know is our most valuable asset, but also to be able to match better skill set to task um, with our colleagues who are on the front lines of case processing. So I'll turn it over to Prava. Thanks, Gary. Um, this slide is basically talking about the end-to-end -end flow and gives you a little bit insight into the technologies that can be used for this end-to-end uh, flow within uh, the uh, PV systems. So on your left is PV Osprey, which is an intake system. So this one is, um, is part of the demo that you'll be seeing today. Um, your, your adverse events could be reported either via calls where you get audios and then the audio gets converted to text. If it is in a different language, then it gets converted, it translated into English or you could get 
an email or you could fill a form, web form, and then or to other uh, channels, you could get the uh, adverse events reported in a textual format and you you get that information and you may have to do translation if it's in other languages and then you translate that data um, and uh, convert it into a data, you know, extract the key information from the text. You could even extract the adverse events, the symptoms that were main, mentioned in that uh, text, uh, do some meta coding. Uh, based on the coding, you can decide on the uh, critica uh, criticality of the uh, adverse event that was reported. And what the system does is it converts it into an XML format, an E2B XML, and sends it to the safety system. There are various AI technologies that are being used here, and some of it will be covered by um, Christine's slide, slides that are coming after this. And we are using Microsoft as your platform and the POC, which you're going to see um, in a bit, which Carrie is going to demo this flow. Um, so once we get the data extracted, the currently the way it's designed is it flows into um, XML, it, it flows into your Argus system, and the this can be converted to any uh, you know safety system. Our demo is going into Argus, but that doesn't mean it's the Argus is the only safety system that can be supported. As you can imagine, any system that takes the E2B files, we can invoke the APIs and create the adverse events in the safety systems. Once you have the um, the data in your safety system. We also have another solution, which is called PVHawk, which is basically a visualization tool which gives more insights into your uh, adverse events and the product, the, the products and the adverse events associated with the product. So the data from Argus gets into um, a data lake, and <clears throat> there is also FDA and UDRA vigilance data that can be brought into the same um, data lake currently. The way it's designed is we are bringing in FDA and in the future we'll be bringing in UDRA vigilance data. And once we have the data, you can overlay this uh, FDA data on the data which you have for your Argus system and then look at, look at it in more details as to how many cases were there per year, per month, per week, per days, and uh, which locations they were there, which uh, age group they were representing, and so on. So that's the end-to-end -end flow over here. Um, I know it's a very short description, but there's a lot of technologies involved, as you can imagine, behind the scenes to get this to flow. And as many things as we can has been automated in this end-to-end -end flow. With that, I'm going to uh, pass over to Christine. So let me move it to the next slide. And Christine, it's all yours. Thanks, Prava. So th there, there are a couple different artificial intelligence and automation capabilities that we're leveraging in this intake process, as Prabha mentioned. But one of the most important ones and really the biggest value add here is the natural language processing capability. And this is how we're actually transforming verbatim written or spoken information to try and interpret the meaning of someone's um, statement. And natural language processing is really the field of artificial intelligence that's focused on understanding that unstructured information. And it really takes into account context, right? So the same thing said in different settings, different scenarios with different contexts and different syntax can mean very different things. So obviously it's a little bit of a, a silly example, but you know, illustrates the point that break a leg set in a theatrical scenario is much different than um, that said in a, a hospital setting. And so when we really apply this technology, again, we're understanding that just because somebody may mention nausea or cramps or fatigue, there's a lot of context around that particular word that we need to take into account in order to accurately interpret that information. So there are many different applications of natural language processing. These are some of the more common applications where we're looking at, again, classification. So thinking about different logical groupings of information. Um, and the one that we're going to really focus in on in this demo and in this intake process is entity extraction. And so we're taking unstructured data. We are applying natural language processing to transform that information to structured data. 
So when we look at really what this looks like, right, we're, we're starting to break down these complex topics. And so this is an example, publicly available source of an intake that somebody provided for an adverse event. And what we're doing is we're taking that information and then we're applying, we're understanding where there are potentially interesting topics, right? So you'll see some of that kind of color coded and highlighted. And then we're applying natural language processing to that text to understand what's the context and what are the structured data elements that we can surface from this in order to make a logical decision. And so you can look at, you know, seeing that the key thing to look at here is, okay, we're understanding that the reaction source was probably a vaccination. We can easily do the measure coding associated with that. And then you can also pull out symptoms, but there are two different types of symptoms that are important to pull out. And this might become also things like maybe it's medical history or family history. And you can start to look at not only is a symptom mentioned, but what's all of the context surrounding that? And so you'll see when we talk about sweats, this particular sentence is describing that that was a positive modality or a symptom that that particular patient was experiencing. And there would therefore be a start date associated with it, right? So what's the time frame for that particular reaction versus saying, you know, I did not have it without the respiratory symptoms. So that symptom is pulled out, but it's considered a negative modality. So it's something that we're actually ruling out and there's no associated start date with that. So natural language processing, this is a very simplistic view of it, but it's starting to again, look at this larger body of unstructured information and pull out very structured data elements that we can use to make logical downstream decisions and ultimately that we can use for that intake process. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Carrie to actually just do a quick demonstration of what that looks like. Thanks, Christine. Um, I just need the ball. Thank you. What we're gonna look at um, this morning is just um, a very quick POC um, or proof of concept that we've called PV Osprey, which is an intake solution. And as Prava and Christine explained, um, the, the purpose of this is really to help automate and to begin to add AI and natural language processing onto that um, data that's coming in from a call center. So what we'll do is I'll input um, a few free text cases similar to what you would see with, with the medical um, intake call, um, or you could also receive it um, you know, if you have web-based forms. And this is designed um, around um, a, a basic intake form that matches um, your adverse event. So I, I won't go through entering all of the patient information, you know, the, the, the age and, and all of that. We're gonna concentrate really on that free, free text field and how that can help with streamlining your data entry and your measure coding. So let's take a look at, okay, so you should be able you should be able to see the beginning of PV Osprey. So this is an intake solution um, and also um, will add, code your, your adverse event and through an XML, it will be pulled directly into Argus. So rather than having to intake this information from a call center or to sit down and do the data entry, basically what happens is um, after the information is collected and the narrative or the verbatim from the reporter is captured, it goes into an ETV XML file, which can then go into your adverse event database. And as probably mentioned, we're using um, Argus this morning. So let's do a couple cases, and I'm just going to enter um, just a few um, a few cases um, that demonstrates different. Um, different products, different adverse events. And again, this is data obtained from a public source. So here we have a patient who calls in and says, I've, it's terrible when you have to type and talk at the same time. I've never been very good at that. So thanks for your patience. So 
So here we have a patient who's received a vaccine and they're calling in and they're saying, you know, um, I took I took the second dose of this vaccine regimen and I, I got chills and I was nauseated and I was dizzy and my heart was racing. One of the nice things about the use of natural language processing and ma machine learning um, is that there can be many different ways to describe a particular event. So racing heart could mean um, the same thing as tachycardia, you know, fluttering heart or my heart was pounding. All of those things have different meanings. And depending on how you would code those verbatim terms, this is set up to match your coding convention. So at the beginning when I mentioned that it's very important to have good processes in place, specifically it's, it's critical that you have harmonization of how you take verbatim terms because we know that they differ um, by, by patient or if it's an investigator reporting or if it's a physician or if it's coming from somewhere different in the world, you may have the same thing being described different ways. So, so if I look, and this is your um, interface, um, so you've entered the patient information, um, and now you've got your verbatim, and this is going to go into the narrative section in your AE database. What you can see is that it's pulled out um, most of these adverse events, so, and it's appropriately coded them um, to measure, I think it's 23.0 that we have loaded um, at this point. We've got nausea, um, and it will give you the um, PT term, um, dizziness, and racing heart. Um, sorry that you can't see that, but it does code to tachycardia. So if I go over here, here will be my um, XML that's generated with all of my patient information, all of the, um, the basic things that you'll need uh, to create a case, a reporter, a patient, an event, and a drug. And then also um, you can custom configure these E2B profiles to include whichever information that you want to have mapped back to um, your database. So that one has already gone into Argus. Um, let's take a second um, narrative. Um, and this is from a patient who received an IM injection of an antibiotic. So um, here we have a patient who received an antibiotic injection um, and they reported that their arm was swollen, it was red, and they had a hard place. Um, they also um, described um, painfulness at that site and they said that they felt feverish. So let's see um, what this comes up with as far as the terms. So we've got injection, which we know we'll throw out because that's, um, that's really referring to um, the, the, um, the actual administration of the product. Um, we have injection site pain. Um, we've got um, swelling. We've got injection site erythema. Um, again, we've got the, the same term. It will only code one time. You won't have multiple um, events. And then feverish um, or feeling hot, uh, we both have to pyrexia. So I can send this over to um, format into an XML, and then that will go right into the pending box um, for case intake in the Argus system. So we'll have to go in and we'll accept that. Here's a little bit more of a complicated case, and this is where it's important to really strategically think about the information that you want to collect on the front end. Um, so this is a patient who also received a vaccine.
Okay. So we have a patient who received um, a second dose of the vaccine, and they're reporting um, chills, nausea, and um, a very painful arm. Um, so we have chills coding to the Medraturn here. We've got nausea. Um, injection, again, is the um, root of administration, so that one we will throw out. And we have injection site pain. What's really concerning here is that I'm seeing oral swelling and I'm seeing shortness of breath. And for those of us who, um, those of us, I'm sorry, you can't see that, but it will be coded as dyspnea. You'll be able to see it in the, um, in the database. What's concerning about this one is that I have, um, now I'm introducing um, a concomitant medication. Um, so my XML is configured to accept um, and to pick out those concomitant medications. So I've got, um, you know, really expected events after um, a vaccine, but um, I'm really, if I'm looking at this case and assessing it as far as seriousness, this might raise a little bit of a red flag. I've got oral swelling and I've got shortness of breath. So that might be indicative of a, a an allergic reaction, it might be indicative of a more severe allergic reaction, such as an anaphylaxoid or an anaphylaxis type reaction. Um, and then I've got benazoprel, which is um, combined in here. So we'll put this into um, an XML and send that over um, into Argus. So I'm going to switch um, for just a second, and we'll go over to Argus, and we'll see how these cases um, actually look in Argus. So what you're looking at, this is um, Argus, and we're using this 8.1.2, and here's the cases that are pending um, for intake into the Argus system. And so um, you've done all the hard work. Um, there's no reason to go into Argus now and to enter all that granular information because it's all contained within um, the E2B. Um, so here I'm just going to accept these cases into Argus. Um, so it gives you some control, which means that you don't have all of this stuff flowing into your database. You have the choice to go and take a look at it and to import it and to select it. And we showed that the cases have all been successfully imported, um, and now we have um, now we have cases, new cases that have come in from this intake solution that we want to take a look at. Um, so here we have um, the first case, which, if you recall, was chills, nausea, dizziness, and a racing heart. And you can see that um, if you go to events and you go to the events. Um, they're already there and they're coded for you, which makes it um, extremely easy. Um, you don't have to, I mean, you can go in and you're, you're basically, um, you have all of your coding done. All of your general and patient information and products um, are already there. So what's left is really to cross-check to do the um, assessment and then to go ahead and to process um, the case, and you can see that the narrative um, as, as typed or received by um, the reporter is in your um, narrative already. Okay, and we can take a look at the, um, the second case, um, which if you recall was an antibiotic. Um, we just renamed it tank methicillin, um, just um, to give it a different name. And this is the patient that said that their arm was swollen, it was red, um, they had a little hard area, and that it was very painful and they felt um, feverish. So we would remove injection. We do have injection site pain, we have swelling, we've got redness or injection site erythema, we've got pyrexia. Um, the only one that it didn't pick up was where it was reported as hard. And here's where, again, the model is continuously learning, so you may have 
you may accept that as injection site swelling or some other type, depending on what your coding conventions are. And again, what you'll find is if you go back to the narrative, you'll see that whatever was in whatever was reported as intake as it, as at the intake point is what you see in the narrative. So here, if you want to come back and you want to add um, something or if there's follow-up to be added, you have plenty of room to do that. So, um, so let's take a look at the third case, which um, was a little bit more complicated because we actually, in this one, inserted the concomitant um, medications that we have. And if you recall, this is the one where it was the second dose of the vaccine. They had some typical vaccine type reactions, but they also had some things that looked a little bit disturbing from um, a seriousness standpoint. So they had oral airway swelling and they were short of breath. So if we take a look at this and we go to the products, you can see that it's captured both the the primary drug, um, which is, if I were the marking authorization holder, would be tank methicillin, and then we've also got um, the concomitant medication, venexapril. And if I go to the events tab, um, here's where you need a little bit of extra time, and you're gaining it because you've decreased the time to get the case actually into your database. Now I've got, I've got nausea, I've got injection site pain. Um, I'm really worried about this oral airway swelling and dipsnia because that looks like a more severe allergic reaction. So what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to look at the, the temporal association of these symptoms, but also because we know that ACE inhibitors have a long history of angioedema and causing these types of symptoms. Here's why I'm going to need a little bit more time if I'm assessing causality of the case to take a look at this, and I may need um, some additional follow-up information. And if we go back to the general tab or the patient tab, we can see um, that we have, this is an example where you've captured in your XML some of the demographics of the patient, so that can all be um, configured and put into this XML. And also, I've got, I've got names, and if I look at the narrative, I can see that, again, whatever I have put in that narrative field on the intake um, is, is displayed right there um, in the narrative. So let me stop from here. What we showed you was, was really kind of a, a very quick and simplistic um, view on how you can take one part of your PV system, which is the um, intake, and you can basically parse whatever is reported and using E2B functionality as probably described, and we can customize that E2B profile to capture whatever data that you would select um, and map that to your database whether independent of whether it's Argus or Eris or, or any other one that's out, um, out on the market. So we've completely eliminated um, the data entry and the metric coding step. So what does this really do as far as your whole PV system? It, it actually has a lot of downstream effects that can save in other areas as well. First, what I've done is I've helped harmonize my data intake process globally. So if I have a global, if I've got several intake sites in different countries, a lot of times, you know, those country-based um, intake have different processes and you don't necessarily have harmonization of the data that you're collecting. By using this type of structure and intake, you're able to harmonize this, which gives you more robust and better data analysis. As Prabha mentioned, we can um, layer languages over this. So, for example, if you decide that you wanted to expand your indication for a product into, I'll say, Russia, and you, needed, you didn't necessarily have someone who 
could man your um, intake center there who was fluent in Russian. You could use a web-based form such as this, and it could be put in. It could be um, displayed in Russian. Um, it could be filled out in Russian. Go through um, a mapping process back to English and appear in your adverse event database. Definitely some resource and time saving, which I'm, I'm happy to show you. Um, the important point here is that by using these technologies, you are able to accommodate waxes and wanes in your case volume without necessarily increasing headcount. Why is this important? For companies perhaps to have what we would call a seasonal product. You make a product uh, such as, the, I'll just use an example, antihistamine. And you would expect to see that there's a peak in antihistamines in the spring and probably in the fall, maybe less later on, um, which can really put a strain on being able to allocate, allocate resources um, within your case processing um, workflow. Um, it definitely decreases the number of touches and time spent on a case for intake activities because I'm going straight from what is reported by the reporter and I'm putting it directly into the database with the terms already um, in the appropriate measure term. Reduce the number of rework from the investigator site. We find that we see this a lot um, where there could be several rounds going back and forth between an investigator. If the um, SAE forms are not filled out or if there's more information, so you can structure an investigator form to do the same thing. Um, however, you may want um, different or more in-depth data. And decrease the compliance risk of missing um, adverse events. Um, that was one of the areas where going into um, different geographical areas and maybe not having the staff to appropriately um, take in all of the information, uh, you may miss cases. Um, and then certainly, um, if we look at the return on investment, here's where the business case is always nice to, um, to be able to take up and to monitor. So what I've done is I basically have taken just the intake process, so the actual intake of the information from the call, um, the data entry into um, your database, um, and the coding, and I've broken it up into a traditional manual workflow. And then on the second line, I've just ballparked how much time you can shave off of this by just this simple addition of this intake solution. So let's say I have 15 minutes for intake. I can drop that down to nine. Data entry usually takes me 30. Now with automation, it takes me 15 because I may have to enter a little bit more information or I may have to schedule a follow-up letter. Measure coding will say from, um, for a series case from eight minutes down to two. And if I look at it, here's the number of hours that I'm spending just on intake for these cases if I have 10,000 cases a year. So around 13,000 hours per year. If I implement just this very simple process that we just demonstrated, I can cut those hours down to 6,917. Well, that's really impressive, and, and shaving something nearly in half is great, but what does that really mean if I'm on the executive management team and I'm looking at what it's going to cost to implement and validate, and what is this really going to do for me over the long term? So if I look at 10,000 cases just for the first year and I ballpark that I'm saving around 6,900 hours and I ballpark at $100 an hour, I'm saving about $691,000 a year. Here's where the business case and the return on investment becomes more meaningful because I'm putting numbers and I'm putting metrics and I'm putting costs around the savings with using these types of technologies. If I back it down to 5,000 cases, $345,000 a year I'm saving. And then if I've got a heavy case influx of 50,000 cases, 
I'm saving around $3.5 million a year. So a significant amount of time and resources that can be redeployed that can be doing other things that we're now required to do as the regulations change um, certainly is an overall benefit. So I'll turn it over to um, Eugene for any questions that you may have. And again, thank you so very much for spending um, an hour of your time this morning with us. Great. Uh, thank you so much, much Carrie. Um, so feel free to ask questions uh, via the chat feature. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the first question. Uh, what are the challenges in implementing automation in PV? Um, I think that's probably a question for all of us, but from the PV perspective, I think the biggest challenge um, is that it's something really new. And there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions around what can be done and what is it going to do to me as far as my um, system is concerned. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of the work also has to go into change management within your organization, reassuring people that this resource savings or this time savings doesn't mean that we're going to lay people off or people are going to lose their jobs. We're just going to be able to absorb more and be more flexible over time. We're also going to have the ability to, um, to redeploy and to do things that take much more time and much more cerebral, what I would call cerebral power, which is evaluating the adverse events, the profile of the adverse events of the product. Are they changing? What does my risk benefit look like? And, and being able to spend more time on the consuming things of like risk management um, and signal detection. Um, probably, and Christine, I'll, I'll let you all take the, the technology um, challenges. Sure, I can take a stab at it. I can think of a couple of things immediately as challenges. One is the expectation, setting the expectation. When we bring in AI and automation, the expectation is everything will take care of it on its own and there's no human intervention. Setting that expectation right that um, any system that's fully automated or fully manual is not going to be um, a, an ideal situation. There should be a good balance and the best things that would work will be a human computer system where the computer does a lot of mundane tasks and they, that is still uh, controlled by the, or some visibility into the, uh, for the human to make some uh, changes or decisions. That's one part. In specific to life sciences, there is another issue. When you are doing a global rollout um, across multiple regions, it could be, you know, uh, you know, across the world, you could have it in hundreds of countries. And understanding the regulatory compliance of each one of those locations and making sure your system adheres to it is going to be, an, and rolling out in all these segments is going to be another challenge. Um, uh, I, th I think you covered it well, Prabha, actually. I think the biggest barrier on the, the AI side is really more about setting appropriate expectations and understanding the, the best applications and uses of the technology. It's actually more on the human side than it is on the technology side, for sure. Uh, but I think you covered that well, Prabha. Awesome, thanks guys. Uh, next question, how does PV Osprey manage descriptive events? For example, a patient stated they felt out of this world. And that's a, that's a really good question. We actually, um, we actually had a couple of cases where there were descriptors um, like that. Um, this is where this is where your model um, would require you to take those types of events, like I heard shrill screaming in my ears, or I felt, you know, the kind of the odd ones. You would you would have to go in and to manually um, code that event, and then it would it would um, facilitate the actual machine learning so the next time that something similar to that came out, it would 
um, it would code it to whatever um, your measure term would be. Um, Christy is probably the better expert on, on how that machine learning can, um, can teach itself over time. Yeah, I think it's just important, again, to understand the types of machine learning. And I think there are some questions also about, like, regulatory compliance and approvals. And it's all somewhat related. Um, you know, typically, you're not using unsupervised learning models in this space, right? So you're not using models that will draw their own conclusions without human review um, and some level of control and governance around the model itself. So typically, you're leveraging a supervised learning approach or semi-supervised learning where you're periodically reviewing output of the model and you are providing feedback, um, essentially reinforcements on model adjustments, and you're, you're retraining the model rather than the model independently making its own um, decisions. So it's really all about, again, the right context and um, understanding the syntax and context in which things are said. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, does PV Osprey pull data from any source, or does it only allow populating paragraphs into it, as shown in the example? Structured forms, fax documents, typewritten documents, PDFs, handwriting. So we've done a lot of automation in this space, right? There's a couple of additional steps you have to take if you have a fax document or a handwritten document where you need to actually convert the image to text before you can do the downstream natural language processing, but it's capable of supporting a variety of inputs across many different channels, again, whether that's spoken, um, written, and we're just using paragraphs of information for simplicity's sake during the demonstration, but we certainly do automation on, um, you know, full documents all the time as well. And typically, you'll pull out that structured data element, and you'll, uh, you know, there's always going to be some information that's structured on a full document, and you'll you would leverage that as your your metadata essentially that you then uh, marry with the entity extraction results. Thank you. Uh, what is the accuracy rate with AI compared to conventional methods of PV? And I guess the follow-up question is that accuracy rate of signal detection with AI. So typically to think about a, you know, a statistically significant model needs to have accuracy as a somewhat misleading term. You typically are looking at um, more of the precision and recall and you're weeding a model based on the specific space um, and you're weeding it either towards a false positive or false negative, again, depending on the particular scenario, one or the other may be more meaningful to the business. Um, so typically what we what we will do is you'll actually do blind tests of the models against human performance. Um, so no model is ever 100% accurate. And one of the activities we'll typically do as we develop the initial models is you're benchmarking that model against people. So you're running the model at the same time that people are doing the same activities. You're comparing the output, essentially that blind test. Um, and we've found many times that the artificial intelligence is more accurate than people um, when it is when it's confident. When it's saying, "I'm confident, I understand what this particular data element is," um, it's always more accurate than people. And so, it's about finding again the right expectation. Nothing's ever going to be 100%, but people are not 100% accurate. Um, that's a, an underlying false assumption. Um, and then it's also looking at establishing the right confidence intervals and the right exception process so that when your model is not confident in an answer, it's typically routed for human review um, and you're, you're adjusting those thresholds, again, based on uh, specific use case and specificity of the model. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, is this automation compatible with all safety databases or only Argus? I can answer that one to save time. Uh, it's compatible with all safety databases. Um, and I guess we have a handful of more questions that we're not going to get to, but let's just ask one more. Um, has there been any communication with regulators as to how they view use of these new technologies in PV, any threshold that must be met, or thoughts around the industry standard? 
And that's a really good question. I think there's some initial guidances um, and or what FDA calls its current thinking around um, using these types of technology that are um, that are available. I think the important thing to consider is that when adding these, that um, you you follow the guidelines on good um, good practices for computer system validation. And you have um, you have your validation um, documents to go along with it, and then you have that time where you're benchmarking um, human versus um, the machine learning, and that you you have um, good processes that um, remain regulatory compliant. Great, thank you. Um, so there are a handful of questions we didn't answer, um, but we'll follow up. And if you have additional questions, feel free to uh, contact any of the speakers. Their contact information is on the screen right now, and um, you'll get a presentation uh, to view it as well. Uh, just wanted to invite everyone to our next webinar. It's happening later this month. Um, we're presenting alongside Oracle about their new clinical development platform called Clinical One. Feel free to register. You can uh, use the link in the presentation or visit our website for more information. Um, at this point, I'd like to really thank our presenters today. We'd like to thank Elizabeth for hosting us today and all of you for joining us. We hope that the information that was provided was very helpful. Again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the day and evening.